Okie dokie. Oh. A podcast for those addicted to the study of scripture. Welcome fellow addicts, this is your safe place to OD. Samuel! Here I am. What are we going to talk about today? Today we are talking about the Gospels. This is Gospels part 137. Last week we started off with Jesus still being in the hands of Pilate and these, let's just say, uh, unruly Jews who are the ones who are motivated to try to unjustly put Jesus to death are continuing to make these untrue claims before Pilate uh, to finally get him to say a verdict of guilty and send him off to be crucified and they start off by saying that like we've got this law and he deserves to die because he claims to be the son of God and um, we talked about it with Pilate he's no question he's a bad man but he's he's in a pickle because this Jesus figure is an enigma you can tell he just emanates wisdom even in being at the verge of death with how he has been flogged and scourged and beaten up and mocked yeah. and Pilate brings him back into his private quarters again and he says like are you not going to say anything to try to defend yourself like don't you know that I have the authority to either release you or to crucify you and Jesus just flexing in his state of at the point of death says you know you wouldn't have any authority if it wasn't given to you from above but then he like almost offers this symbol of mercy by saying like the one delivering me over is going to have the greater sin which is really interesting to consider concerning Pilate is the one that has the last say in this matter but the the people he, he brings Jesus back out and the people they they pushed Pilate more into a corner and they said like if you don't hand him over to be crucified then you are no friend of Caesar's and like basically like we're going to tell the the upper ups <laughs> uh, beyond your authority that you are not doing your job and you could tell at that point that Pilate is just wanting to get this over with finally they like the, these people say we have no king but Caesar after Pilate says like behold your king the king of the Jews yeah and um and then they deliver him over to be crucified and so Pilate wipes his hand in the situation and that's the last that we see of him in the text and then from there they put his regular clothes back on him and they gave him his cross beam to carry but the text kind of <laughs> infers that he was in such a bad state that they had to get this guy who was in, on the side of the street with these crowds that were following Jesus, Simon of Cyrene, who apparently had been visiting potentially for the Passover to help him carry it for the remainder of the way. And once Simon helps out, Jesus clicks into teaching mode again and starts prophesying <laughs> yeah. about the uh, the state of the nation whenever the temple is going to be destroyed and people are going to wish that they yeah. had never been born. Um, so it's amazing that Jesus is still prioritizing teaching his father's message, even in the midst of such suffering. Yeah. To the bitter end. Yeah. He does. And yeah, and real quick, we just ended with, uh, the, the place where he was going to be crucified was called Golgotha, the place of the skull and two criminals were going to be put to death alongside him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I'm looking back and you know how sometimes you look back at something you've done and you think, uh, maybe I would have done that differently if I had a chance, but it's too late because we already did that episode. So, <laughs> Oh, no, um, you're having regret? Eh, I don't know if I'd call them that, but yeah, whatever. Uh, so he here's where we're going to pick up. We're looking at Matthew chapter 27, verse 34, Mark chapter 15, verse 23, and one of the points that I want to make here, well, here, let me go ahead and read it, and then I'll tell you what I'm talking about. Here's, here's Matthew. They offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. So the point I wanted to make is that, uh, right here, he's not actually up on the cross yet. 
at least if we're following along in the synoptic story. But I noticed that in John, the very, very last thing I included in John, it says, there they crucified him, uh, you know, with him uh, and two others and all that, which means he was actually up on the pole. And so I got that a little bit out of whack. I probably should have included that below, but whatever. We're just saying he's not exactly up on the cross yet when they're offering him this wine. So that's trying to clarify your mental image there. And then some, I think this is actually kind of a good question. Some wonder, well, who is this they that they're talking about? They offered him wine. Well, it was it the, the soldiers. Was it some of the disciples or the women or the crowd that were following behind, whatever? We don't know. But I would say that in the continuing narrative, soldiers seems the most likely or the most obvious they're going to be the ones that are being referred to as they throughout this little part here. And this is why pronouns are such an issue sometimes. But I just think it's interesting to think that it was the soldiers possibly who are offering him this drink. Now, on one hand, you might look at this and you go, oh, well, Jesus was refusing wine. And, and and we might go back to Matthew chapter 26, verse 29, when he says, I'm not going to drink it again until I drink it with you in the kingdom. Now, was he talking about wine, period? Was he talking about a Passover cup? Those are, you know, those are reasonable questions. Here's the thing, though. Scholars generally believe that this mixture, uh, remember Matthew said it was mixed with gall. Mark says it's mixed with myrrh. They believe that this mixture was intended to actually ease his pain. Now, you might think, wow, what, they really? They were doing something merciful? No, that was actually going to, what do you want to call it, extend the, the crucifixion or whatever. So <laughs> there's, never, there's never anything super nice in here, okay? But it was intended to ease pain. That's what most scholars think. So again, we don't know for sure, but if that's the case... Just think about this, Samuel. Jesus is going through some excruciating stuff. He's all ripped to shreds on his back. They're, he's, they're attaching him to this cross beam. They're going to hang him up on this pole, whatever. And he chooses not to get relief. It's, it's If this is true, that it's about pain relief, and if Jesus recognizes that, if that's really the thing that he's saying no to, it's like he wanted the complete, raw, unadulterated experience of human suffering. And <laughs> for I, I, Honestly, just, just think about yourself, any person. I have no explanation as to why he would do that. It seems wrong to us. I mean, when we have an opportunity to alleviate some suffering, especially our own, <laughs> we're right on it, right? But here are a couple of possibilities. Number one, he knew that this was God's will, that he, you know, be dying in this manner, whatever. And so he wanted to be as obedient as he could possibly be. And then number two, it kind of relates to it. There's a verse from Hebrews that I'd like you to read, Samuel. It's Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Yeah. And so it's like, and now think about that. Jesus learned obedience. That's a big deal right there. And, and we also, like him, must learn obedience. So that's important. But he learned it. How? Through what he suffered. Samuel, do you think it's possible we're going to be learning also through suffering? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Great news, right? Okay, not. But Jesus, just think about this. He's apparently learning to be perfectly obedient through even this experience here on the cross. He is taking the greatest amount of suffering he can get, which is kind of weird, but through it, he's learning the greatest amount of obedience. And maybe that's an extreme view of it or something like that, but it is instructive for us. And I'm just going to say, we 
we need to toughen up and we need to get serious, people. If this was good enough for Jesus, I'm not saying that we all have to live exactly the same way and suffer exactly the same way, but you know, we ought to be up for a little bit as a as a conduit, as a medium, as a method for perfecting our own obedience. So what do you got to say about that, Samuel? Yeah, it's that's a strong call to give up our lives, so to speak, to pursue the mission in the heart of God. I also wanted to point out that with you saying that why he chose not to experience this relief through the wine and gall mixture, and you had said that he potentially knew this to be God's will. This is just one reference, but I was just reading that some people argue that there are multiple kind of like messianic kind of hint hintings of taking this bitter drink for relief or refusing it um i'm wondering if jesus is like trying to be obedient in the fulfillment of prophecy in the hebrew scriptures so oh yeah psalm 69 yeah. verse 21 uh, depending on which version you read it could say quote they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst yeah that's a good one. In fact, it's coming up later as well, because the, he this happens more than once okay. in the story. So, yeah, that's perfect. That's perfect. That Psalm 69, Psalm 22, there's just some, oh my gosh, it's amazing how close it matches all we're seeing here. So, sorry, what else you got? That's it. All right. Well... Let's see what else happens then. We're going to move on looking at Matthew chapter 27, verses 35 and 36. Mark chapter 15, verses 24 and 25. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. And John chapter 19, verses 23 and 24. And Samuel, I'm actually going to read a lot here because uh, the information is all spread out. So uh, let me start with John. It's the longest one. Let me do that. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier. Also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now, let's look at some of these other things that we didn't hear there in John. In Luke, it says, And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. So that's like a classic phrase. Everybody, you know, hey, yeah, everybody remembers that. And then here's another interesting little bit from Mark. Remember, at one point we were told that it was the sixth hour of the day. So that would be around noonish. Well, Mark says this in verse 25, and it was the third hour when they crucified him. So we've got some big discrepancy here. Uh, in, on one hand, it makes it look like the crucifixion was maybe about a three-hour-ish deal. But with what Mark's talking about, it's more like a six-hour-ish deal. So that's a thing to notice. But let's get into this. There's, boy, there's a lot here. Uh, first, you're going to need to uh, just know that, okay, there's a couple small sections of John. I'm kind of reordering them a little bit just to line up with the others. And, and now is when I'm going to focus in on that phrase that they they had crucified Jesus. Basically, what they're saying is, is that he is now up on the cross. The, the cross beam has been mounted up on the pole. It doesn't mean that it's over and he's done with. It's He's now up there on the pole. Also, we need to kind of remember, it's Passover Eve. And at least at this point, that is the version of the story that we're going with. And what's funny 
I I didn't know this the, the, when we were first going through it, Samuel. But even in the Talmud, it actually tells us that this was happening on Passover Eve. It's in uh, Sanhedrin forty three a. But how weird that some of the Jewish documents, Jewish books, whatever, talk about this Jesus guy and the fact that he was crucified on this day. Mm. So it's kind of cool. Now, John gives us some interesting details. Okay, first, there are four soldiers, and they're there to, you know, guard or watch over those who are being crucified. And now, here's what we don't know. I mean, somebody might, but I never found it explicitly anywhere. Is it four soldiers guarding all three guys being crucified, or does each guy have four soldiers? I can't really tell you, but you get the idea. Remember, though, what's funny about this, there was an entire cohort back at Pilate's. They were in his facility. Everybody was safe in there. Now that they're out in the public where there really could be trouble, there's just four soldiers. I think that's weird. But these four soldiers, uh, let's just say, apparently, they had a keen interest in his clothing. And again, it's kind of weird since he's thought to have been poor or at, at best just kind of average and every piece of his clothing was likely stained with blood and i mean who knows samuel maybe they thought they could sell it on ebay now you know their thinking might have been something like well whether we believe in him or not doesn't really matter maybe some of his fans would be willing to pay a lot for this stuff right see what i'm saying now granted i'm teasing a little bit but it's common for the soldiers to take the stuff, most specifically the clothing of those being crucified, uh, and then they divide it up. And it's it's not as if he had, you know, a bunch of pieces of clothing and they were all taking a bit. They were literally tearing it into pieces. They would take this clothing, tear it into pieces, and then each soldier would get a piece. The tunic, however, as it mentions, it was somewhat special because it just happened to be a single piece with no seams. And that actually had a, a higher value. It's kind of kind of interesting that Jesus had that, maybe as a gift from one of the women that support the ministry, or who knows. But the soldiers recognize it as a higher value, as a single whole. And so, rather than to tear it in pieces, they decide they're going to throw dice, cast lots, right? And the winner gets the tunic. Now, Another thing I'd like to point out, and this is only because we see different depictions in TV, movies, whatever. It was long. It likely hung to his feet for many just normal cultural reasons, but even more so because he was a teacher. It was super, I mean, that was like, that was the common garb. So it was likely very long down to his feet. And then I don't know if you remember they dressed him up so that they could do this perp walk, you know, carrying the cross and all the thing he's supposed to be doing. Well, now that he's hanging on the cross, well, he's naked again. Sorry, it's family show. We're doing our best. <laughs> but he, it, again, there, he's dying and maybe you don't care about stuff like that, whatever, but it's all intended to increase the humiliation, degradation, all of that. So just helping you mental image, seeing what they're doing to people. Did they now, not? Did people not wear some sort of like loincloth underneath the tunic? Not according to anything that I found. Only in okay. TV and movies. Okay. And you know that's I'm sure so that they don't get some sort of rating. You can't watch it on TV anymore. Right. <laughs> you know. But yeah, I think we're talking uh, uh, Kentucky necking. So uh, now, now John he tells us that this was to fulfill the scripture from Psalm 22, verse 18, the part about dividing his garments and casting lots. Now, this is super interesting because it's that same Psalm, Psalm 22, that begins with the phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is famously going to come up here in just a little bit. So that's very interesting. John's telling us they're fulfilling that. Now, Luke tells us that Jesus prays for forgiveness for them. Now, I remember a second ago, we were wondering who they was. Now they wonder who them is. And, okay, 
I'm just going to say it again. The immediate context would suggest the soldiers. But obviously, it's not unreasonable to stretch that out to apply to more people. And you might even say to all of his enemies. And here's the surprise. This is famous, right, Samuel? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Everybody knows that comes from Jesus in the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. Well, this sentence isn't even in some of the earliest and most reliable transcripts. It's not even there. However, like the other places where we've discussed things like this, it definitely does not hurt the story in any way. There's nothing outside the bounds about it. It doesn't change our theology or doctrine or anything. And in fact, it fits really well with Luke's continual theme of forgiveness in his gospel. So, I mean, okay, maybe we should just kind of hold that phrase a little more loosely than we normally do, but it's, you know, I think it's still valid and good, whatever. So we don't have to like throw shade or anything. Now, uh, what else we got? Importantly, Jesus's prayer is considered the first of Jesus's seven last words. Now, that's the phrase that I grabbed onto. There may be other ways that it gets referred to. And we're going to try to remember to point out some of the others, but what he did here, it was very godlike. And Samuel, I don't know if you remember, way back in the Sermon on the Mount, this came from Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 and 45, did Jesus say something about your enemies? He say, uh, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Exactly. Yeah. Jesus is doing exactly what he said we should do and doing it at, I mean, if you were ever going to fail, wouldn't now be the time? I mean, he is so close to death, just pushed to the limit in every way. But if we take these words and say, nah, you know, maybe they weren't in the early transcripts, but we trust they were there. There's more reason to believe that it really was possibly said that because it impacted the believing community greatly. In fact, Many martyrs were said to say this exact same or something similar to it at their death. And just as an example, Samuel, I'd like you to read from Acts chapter 7, verse 60, where Stephen is speaking right before he dies. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Yeah. Lord, don't hold this sin against them. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You see the similarity. Mm-hmm. This, this became kind of, a, kind of a thing, right? If you're being martyred, well, maybe you better do what Jesus did, right? It's, 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 it's super cool. And just one final little bit. I know I mentioned it a little bit before, but Mark is telling us that it's the third hour, 9 a.m.-ish. And... It, this would have been, if if this is accurate, it's the same time they were doing the morning sacrifice. Remember, they had a, a daily sacrifice, once in the morning, once in the evening kind of thing. Well, this was the morning one, if that lines up. The discrepancy, though, the weirdness is that earlier John had told us that it was noon back in John 1914, noonish. So what do you say? Darn those eyewitness accounts, whatever you're going to do, they're just not perfect, but We're just going through, taking them for what they say and trying to piece it together. So, man, seemed like there was a lot more commentary than there was text. But Samuel, what do you you got on there? Uh, The the only thing I'm wrestling with at the moment is it seems inconsistent with the brutality of crucifixion that the Romans were performing on people in this day for them to have this drink mixture to alleviate some pain like I, I don't quite understand what their motivation would have been for doing that whenever we've said previously that people could have stayed up on the cross for days potentially and all of the intense beating and scourging that happens in addition to that can you shed some light on the heart behind that yeah, I, I I can't say anything as if I actually know. The only thing that comes to mind for me is I, I think about uh, what we know in the modern day. 
We know, for example, that with proper pain management, the body heals more quickly. You've heard of that, right? Mm -hmm. So in a similar way, I think what they were doing, it's very counterintuitive. By giving them something to numb the pain, they were actually making it so that this crucifixion was prolonged. It was... uh, in the long run, they actually suffered more, whether it's through the humiliation or, you know, whatever, the thirst, this, that, whatever. That's all I can think of because we know, I think, I think we can just say that we know they weren't doing anything nice. Right. That's completely out. So it has to be that it, in some measure, actually made whatever they were doing during the crucifixion, you know, in the end, it actually had to make it worse. And so that's the only thing that I can come up with. It prolonged it in in some sense. I don't know. That's interesting, though, if that is a possibility, just because when you think about Rome and then being an empire, I always picture empires to be well-oiled machines of getting stuff done for their own purposes or whatever and drawing out these public executions that that just seems inefficient like if i don't know like it seems like an empire would rather just be like off with their head and then get it over with and bring the next you know troublemaker that they deem worthy of death down to put him up and get him gone Oh, yeah. From that perspective, you're absolutely correct. Is it efficient or inefficient? Oh, well, that would actually make it inefficient. But now let's switch the switch the words. Is it merciful or evil? Oh, 100 (laughs) percent evil. Yeah. (laughs) So I think from their perspective, it's like, hey, yeah, we are a big machine. We, We can accomplish whatever we want. But they were also interested in suffering, pain, evil, whatever you want to call it. So gotcha. I, I just, I don't know. I think it's both. Yeah. Anything else in there? Because I was a lot. Yeah, I'm good for the moment. Okay. Well, uh, we're right in the middle of the climax of the story, so we may as well keep going, huh? Uh-huh. Let's see. We, uh, we're we going to look at Matthew chapter 27, verses 37 and 38. Mark chapter 15, verses 26 and 27. John chapter 19, verses 19 through 22. And I'm just going to go ahead and keep reading from John. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, This man said I am king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. (laughs) So, (laughs) this is just crazy. So, if you'll notice, again, the, the, the verses from John, they're slightly out of order, but... No big deal. We'll be catching up here real real soon. We're just trying to get a, a reasonably sensible flowing of the story. Now, Jesus' sign, okay, under any normal circumstance, Jesus' sign should have read something like Yeshua sedition or, or something of that nature, right? Your name and your crime, Yeshua sedition. Instead, Pilate makes it read Yeshua, king of the Jews. And he does it in three languages. Now, you may think that that's like overkill or something, but that was also common. So I don't think there was anything special about him doing three languages for Jesus. But you got to think that Pilate, again, he probably thought this was all pretty funny. But in it, and we've seen this a number of times most recently, Samuel, it's more of this unintentional prophecy stuff. Jews from all over Israel and from outside Israel had come to Jerusalem for the Passover. And John tells us that many Jews saw the inscription. 
just for clarity, it was it was likely on the road that was leading into Jerusalem right there at the Garden Gate. Now, since it was in three different languages, it's likely that every Jew, or really every person that saw it, was able to read it. Now, we can't say if they agreed or truly understood or whatever, but they were taking in truth in that moment. When they saw Yeshua, King of the Jews, that was truth, and they they were seeing, witnessing it, whatever. Now, the chief priests, obviously, they didn't think this was funny at all. In fact, they were really bothered that all of the Jews seeing the sign might, okay, in their mind, they might misunderstand. We know that that means that they would actually truly understand. They wanted Pilate to fix it. Don't say that he, you know, is the king of the Jews. You need to say that he said he's the king of the Jews. But Pilate couldn't care less. Besides, he probably derives pleasure knowing that it's getting under their skin. So he's not going to change it. He tells them, you know, it is what it is. I, I wrote what I wrote. Uh, and, and now a side note, I just want to say, when it says that Pilate wrote an inscription or attached it to the cross or what I've written, I've written or whatever, it doesn't mean that Pilate actually physically did it himself. It just means that this was done by his order, by his direction. So I wanted to make that clear in case you've got a mental image of this, <laughs> I don't know, pudgy little leader of, of some province in Rome coming out there and doing the work himself. He's not. So anyway, there's that. Samuel, you got anything on that stuff? Yeah, what I'm about to illustrate as a just being hypothetical is going to seem like I'm trying to vindicate Pilate, and I'm not. Um, we are, we've all established that he is a bad guy, but <laughs> yeah. I, I just can't help but th wonder or, I don't know, maybe hope uh, that this unintentional prophecy stuff of the phrase being Yeshua, King of the Jews comes like if if that is what Pilate explicitly decreed to have them right above his head that that's coming from his powerful interactions with Jesus and I mean like you said like definitely doing it to be like you know get back at these Jewish leaders who were just Envious. chomping at the bit to get this guy killed when in his eyes he's like he does not seem guilty to me in any respect but I guess I just wonder like if there was any sort of like pause for him to that he intentionally chose that phrase instead of something else because like I mean, he said that he that his kingdom was not of this world and like I can't you know I'm just speaking hypothetically as pilot right now like I can't remember interacting with someone else who has been put to death that conducted himself and held himself with so much wisdom and composure in something yeah. so extreme. So I, I don't know if you are grasping what I'm painting, but in, in the same way that we have tried to give, I mean, it's a Jewish idea of giving people the benefit of the doubt. Like we've, we've done that with Judas and his betrayal. Right. And I guess here I am trying to do that in some sense in this small moment of the the sign with Pilate. Yeah, it's, you know, it's difficult to say what was really going on inside Pilate's head. We do know that he didn't think he deserved to die. We do know that he was bothered by things that his wife said, even things that Jesus said, talking about him being a son of God, the chief priest told him, you know, all of that. Hey, who knows what's going on in his head? And maybe there is some part of him that, yeah, it's maybe it's, it's one of those uh, two birds, one stone. I get to get under their skin because I know they're going to hate this. And honestly, maybe there was some part of him that's going, I don't know. Maybe there's something to this whole king thing. I don't know. I, it, yeah, it's hard to say. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, that's it for now. All right. Well, the story continues. We're just going to keep reading from John. We, we I didn't mention this before. Uh, 
we left out the last line of chapter 19, verse 24. So we're going to start there and we're going to go through verse 27. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold, your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold, your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Well, it's an interesting, touching little moment right in the middle of all this horrible suffering and all that, right? So back to Jesus. The soldiers had been dividing his garments. And John tells us that, well, and, and this is a difficulty, three or four women and at least John, the writer of this gospel, right? That's the disciple whom he loved. Well, they were near the cross. Here's what we know. We know that we've got his mom. Her name was Mary or Miriam, more, more correctly. And we also have Mary Magdalene. That's Mary of Magdala. Her name was also technically Miriam. And then here's where it gets a little bit fuzzy. It could be that Jesus's aunt is there and that we don't know her name. And then there's also someone that is Clopas's wife and her name is Mary, which also is technically Miriam. It could be that. Or it could be that his aunt is named Mary and she was married to Clopas. And now, logically, if that one were true, this Mary would have to be something more like a, I don't know, a sister-in-law or something, because otherwise you'd have two sisters with the same name. So that would be kind of crazy. But I don't know if you heard that in there, Samuel. Mary, Miriam, was obviously a popular name. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) All right. Now, we're going to hear about a similar group of women when we get to the synoptic version of the story. But in that version, it, it, it happens a little bit later. And the actual women included don't match very well. In fact, out of the entire list, Mary Magdalene is the only match between this list and the one that we're going to see later. But however it is, whoever it is, you got three or four women and John, they're standing there doing this stuff. It's important for John's story that one of them is his mom because Jesus, he picks up on the fact that his mom is there and John is there. And so Jesus, okay, at most, only a few hours from death, continues his love and care and mercy from the cross. Jesus tells his mom that she should allow John to care for her as if he was the firstborn son, taking Jesus's place. He also tells John that he should care for his mom, Jesus's mom, like she was his own. Now, uh, well, okay, I got to remember not to forget this support. This is another one of those seven last words. Uh, This one is actually usually like on number three on the list. We're not going to worry about the sequence too much. Jesus fulfills one final commandment, and that is to honor your father and mother. And a lot of people, especially like today, America, They think honor your father and mother. They think in terms of like respect and this and that. And I'm not saying that those aren't good things, but in Jesus' day, in Jesus' time, the idea of honoring your father and mother was most closely associated with making sure that they were properly cared for, Uh, you know, like physically, financially, whatever. You, You made sure they had what they needed. So that, and and this commandment actually came with a promise, that your days may be prolonged. So here's Jesus honoring his mother. His father's gone. And the the, the supposed result of, of keeping that commandment is that your, day, your days might be prolonged. <laughs> it's kind of ironic. He's hanging up on the cross, ready to go. But here's the weird part, Samuel. So Mary, Jesus' mom, did she have any other children? 
Uh, I know that there was a, a James. Yeah. She had other children. She had other sons. And James, what did he eventually do in this whole Jesus movement thing? He would lead the Jewish assembly. Yeah. He led the church, the, the, what we think of as the church in Jerusalem, the, the, the believers, the remnant. Also, okay, so Mary had other sons. John also had a mom. And we have no evidence whether she was dead or alive at this point, but it's it's very possible that she's still alive. And so what exactly is going on here? Why would Jesus do this thing? And I think, I, I read a couple of people talking about this, and this, this really, uh, I find it compelling. It's like we can see in this the joining of two families. We've got the family where those who do the will of God are his mother and sister and brothers. Do you remember him, Jesus talking about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's one family. And then you have his actual blood family, Mary and the other sons and all that. His mother was going to be under the care of a disciple. And that disciple was in the, those who do the will of God family. And the disciples eventually are going to end up under the care of Jesus's physical brother. So I just think that is such a cool picture. And it's sort of a reunited and it feels so good, right? So, right? So we're joining those two families together. I think that's a super neat image. Now, some speculate that by this point, Jesus's mom had actually begun to believe. And I mean, even part of the reason that she was there is because she was following not just her son who was being crucified, but she was following Jesus as as Messiah. But Jesus's brothers, everybody seems pretty convinced they still were not. I think the resurrection was kind of a big deal for them. But we'll see. So Jesus wanted her to be cared for by his true family, and that's the you know, who are my mother, who is my brothers, right? And just for reference, that's back in Matthew chapter 12, 46 to 50, Mark chapter 3, 31 to 35, Luke chapter 8, 19 to 21. And at least it's it's possible. This is one possible interpretation of what was going on in people's heads at that time. The thing is, they both did as they were asked or commanded, however you want to look at that. And it's obvious from John's telling of the story that John was Jesus's favorite, Right, <laughs> which I don't know. That always just makes me smile. Uh, but it could also be that John, uh, that Jesus picked him because he knew John would be around the longest. That's a possibility. Or maybe it was just because he was the only one who happened to be there, close to the cross. Who knows? But John and Jesus's mom, they now become family. Family. So I don't know. Kind of a neat image. What do you got there, Samuel? Yeah, I'm really, I don't know if struggling is the right word, but wrestling with this idea that this moment in Jesus' mom's life, seeing him on the cross and hearing him say these things was a turning point for him, uh, for her, I mean, uh, to truly begin to believe him as the Messiah and follow his authority when oh, I don't. I'm, I don't know that anybody is suggesting that. Oh, okay. I thought. Yeah, I, you had no. you had said that uh, Jesus' no. mom had begun to believe and follow. Yes, like she had already done so, and so while she is here in this moment at the cross, she's already a believer. Oh, okay. Now, that's just speculation. Nobody knows at all but but that's what i was trying to relate earlier so okay. just to clear that up yep well, that that fixes it just because i was thinking back at the nativity story in luke one and and what the angel gabriel said to her oh right like i mean she, he said like he will be called the son of the most high the, the lord god will give him the throne of his father david and he will reign over yeah. jacob's descendants forever his kingdom will never end like you yeah. can't be more explicit than that in terms of telling a mother those statements in that context that that's like messianic, like to a T. So, oh, yeah, 
it um you're I'm, I'm glad we just cleared that up so I, i'm good and hopefully the listeners are too <laughs> yeah yeah the thing is and and it, what you bring up is a great point you almost also need to ask that question well did she ever not believe it i mean how could she not based on you know how it all came about in the beginning and all those things but again we have that that weird point and and you know, so much of this is we're we're trying to imagine who was thinking what, who was believing what, who was feeling what when all these stories are going on. But at that moment when they come to get Jesus, it's like, dude, you, you need to come home with us. It did have that sense of you're you're there's something wrong. We need to get you back home. We need to somehow take care of you. Mm. Right. And that was his mom and his brothers. And so that's when we started to question, well, I don't know. Does she, along with her brothers, maybe not buy into this whole thing? Has he lived, did he live so long with them as, you know, just call it a normal human person that they started to, even she started to lose sight of that or whatever? We don't know. But that's why some, some think, nope, you know what? By the time we get to this point, she's already fully back on board. She thinks he is Messiah. But not everyone believes that. Some believe that even at this point, Mary isn't a true believer, even with everything that you brought up and everything that we know that happened in her life. It's, it's, it's crazy. And again, nobody knows the answer, but it's, I, I don't know. I think it's, it's good to think about and imagine yeah. because this, this would be a hard thing to accept. Just on every level, it would just be hard. And could it even be that it, it was hard for his own mom? I you know, I don't know. Yeah, it's I can give some credence to those people who are wrestling with the idea that she potentially may not have believed right away whenever I mean the in Luke two nineteen where it's the text says that Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Like yeah. you could interpret that as like she's wrestling with the gravity of all this and she doesn't know what to make of it and everything. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah well, I don't t- totally understand why some people would be in that position. Yeah. And there's th- that additional fact that we've mentioned so many times. He's not taken over as king of the earth reigning from Jerusalem. He's getting killed up on a cross. Yeah. Right. So yeah. all of it, it there, it's just, it's really hard to put them in a box and think we know what they're talking about, what they're saying. Well, you want to try to do one last little bit? Sure. All right. This is in Matthew chapter 27, verses 39 to 44, Mark chapter 15, 29 to 32, and Luke chapter 23, 35 to 38. Uh, I'm going to read from Matthew, and I think I want to catch a little bit that I got in Luke. So anyway, here's Matthew. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and the scribes and elders mocked him saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now, Luke, the only reason I want to read this bit is because we've seen all of the people that are picking on him. Luke adds this, verse 36 and 37. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. So you can see everybody's picking on him in this moment. Now, again, just so you get the mental image, he's crucified in a very public place place. Many would be passing by and seeing him. Many would be seeing that inscription. Remember, we said they're actually seeing the truth. It's kind of cool. But many of them derided him 
They laughed. They dismissed him. They ridiculed him. They treated him with contempt. They scorned him. They made sport of him. They mocked him. They scoffed at him, shaking their heads. And apparently, either they had really good memories like they'd seen and heard him before, or possibly more likely, they were being goaded on by the chief priests and all of those guys. They, they've got to say all the, you were going to destroy and rebuild the temple in three days. Why don't you save yourself? You're the son of God. Come down. Even the soldiers are joining in. Yeah, if you're the king, save yourself. So the chief priests, scribes and elders, well, obviously they're also joining in. They acknowledge that he saved others. And what did he save them from? Disease, handicap, demons, even death. But they mock him because he can't, and of course we know in hindsight he actually won't, save himself. They mockingly call him the king of Israel and declare that if if he will come down off that cross, they will believe in him too. Do you think they really would, Samuel? (laughs) No. No. They acknowledge that Jesus lived trusting God. But then they, you know, turn that around on him. So let's see if God will deliver him now, if he wants to. I mean, why wouldn't he? Because, I mean, he's the son of God, right? What's amazing is that it's like this is all a quick summary of Jesus's life and ministry. All of the, I mean, honestly, really good, great things that he's done, but it's being thrown back in his face. None of it's worth anything. It can't mean anything because there you are up on a cross. They're all joining in. They're calling him a fraud and a liar. And looking back, it's hilarious because they're also doing something else, Samuel. I think it's another one of those unintentional things. They're alluding back to Psalm chapter 22, verses 6 through 8. And and I doubt that they're doing it on purpose. But it talks about them mocking him and and all of the things that you're seeing actually happening here. I, we don't need, we're not even going to bother reading it because if you're listening to this, you need to go back and read Psalm 22. It's just mind-blowing mm-hmm. how that actually speaks to everything that we're seeing here. But Matthew, he tells us that even the two criminals that are being crucified with him join in. And this is all it's it's like it's the worst kind of irony, well, or the best. I guess it depends on your perspective. At this point, we might recall those who joined in the triumphal entry. Now, actually, some of those, they may be here. And you have to imagine, after a week ago, that triumphal entry, they are just shocked and dismayed. I mean, this is its just not what they expect. It's just not. And and so it's kind of crazy. But anyway, that's where we're leaving off. I think, Samuel, we have we have we've done the cliffhanger. Yeah. It's like it's our job. <laughs> yeah. People should not be surprised. Right, right. So um, what do you got there? Yeah, it I I want to point out how un I gotta choose my words carefully. Um <laughs> how numb someone truly has to be or calloused of heart to be in a spot where you see someone as broken down physically as Jesus would have been considering all the things that he had just been through up up until getting up on the cross and now on the cross itself I'm just thinking in myself and I have to think that this is an assumption for most people in the world like i i'm not undermining that we all have this bent towards self-preservation and selfishness that we have to battle with and deal with 100 percent, that's true but i still think that that's not at play with what we're seeing here like whenever i am seeing let's just say i'm not comparing jesus to an animal but when i see animals in pain or i even see if, like previous family members who have passed away and them suffering and in pain like it like it makes me almost want to throw up in terms of like how much i hate to see that and right. for 
these people to they are physically visually seen blood gore oh, jesus yeah, likely probably would have been screaming in pain uh at times and they continue to like do the things that you just read in this text like to me i know i don't want to be that person that's like oh the devil did it but there's like that's just, it just feels like some essence of pure evil like really blinding this small group of people who have chosen to go down this path to just make the situation worse like i just it's so hard for me to fathom that these people are actually choosing to continue to egg on the situation given what they're seeing with their own eyes like it's just i i, I can't comprehend it yeah it's truly shocking it should be shocking and i mean here's you named a lot of different people just imagine if it was your worst enemy but you saw them beaten, broken, bloodied, disfigured, suffering up on a cross. If you do not feel some sort of sorrow, hurt, uh, something for them, man, I, I think you really need to grow <laughs> in your uh, imaging God, your your mercy, your something. I mean, you should be bothered by this. And yeah, these people, they're just, I mean, they're they are making fun. I mean, this reminds you of how cruel children can be on a playground mm. or something when children don't know any better. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They're, they're still being formed. These are adults. Mm -hmm. And all he ever did, here's the other point. It, even if you didn't know him, if you did know him, yeah. He never did anything but help people. It's true. Ah, ah, but you're right. It's shocking. Oh, one last thing I wanted to bring up is that, uh, and I'm probably spoiling it for next week, but it's okay. Like you said, the the the, <laughs> the verse in uh, Matthew 27 for 44, it's a, it, it uses the plural form. It says, "And the robbers, one of the two robbers." there's going to be some kind of redemption involved. And to me, it's like, that is a quick 180 degree turnaround for if, if, if Matthew is right in saying both of the robbers were participating in this deri derision. And then, and then later, just if maybe minutes or an hour, he's repenting. Like, I don't know. Right. That's, that's kind of crazy. It is. Yeah. Now, to be fair, Matthew is the one who's saying that it's both, and it's Luke who's going to later tell us that you know one of them has a bit of a change of heart, uh, okay. it's that whole eyewitness thing. But, yeah, crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. It's a big 180. Anything else? I think we'll let them enjoy being on the edge of the cliff for now. That's right. Yeah, hang on that cliff, people. All right. Well, let's be done. Okie dokie. Thank you for listening to the Okie Dokie Most Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Be sure to leave us a rating and a review to let us know how this content is impacting your life. You can find out more information about the podcast at www.okidokimos.com. And if you'd like to get a hold of us, please send us an email at okidokimos at gmail.com. Until next time, we pray that you will do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We'll talk to you again soon.